In this lesson, we'll be covering one of the higher-end difficulty concepts for word problems on the quantitative reasoning section of the GMAT Focus Edition, and that's going to be overlapping sets. So let's begin just by considering overlapping sets, theoretically using a Venn diagram to illustrate what's happening. So you can see we've got a couple of circles, and they overlap in the center as illustrated. Now, we're going to have our possible groups, and we've got to consider them holistically to understand how the overlapping sets will function. So group A is just going to be represented by the circle on the left-hand side. Group B is going to be illustrated by the circle on the right-hand side. The overlap, or what is technically known as the intersection, is going to be the space in between the two circles for group A and group B, and those are individuals or items that are categorized as both A and B simultaneously. But of course, you also could have individuals or items that are neither part of group A nor part of group B, but are included in an overall larger total. So you have to consider your neithers as well. So that's our structure. But in the construct of the GMAT Focus Edition, you're probably not going to want to draw a Venn diagram every time you encounter an overlapping sets scenario in a problem solving question. So we're going to simplify it into some basic group equations. First, we know that our total or union is going to be equal to those items or individuals in group A, plus those items or individuals in group B, minus those items or individuals in the overlap or intersection, plus those that are in neither of the two called out groups A and B, but part of the larger overall total. And the way you can conceptualize this is if, say, we've got an individual bill and bill is part of both group A and group B concurrently, we don't want to count two bills in our total. There's only a single bill. Bill just happens to qualify for both of the two groups. And that's why you have to subtract out those that are in the overlap or intersection to avoid the double counting. You also can solve for just group X, meaning either group A or group B, by itself by taking group A or group B as group X and subtracting out the overlap. For instance, if we're trying to count all of the individuals or items in group A, but Bill is in group A and the overlap, we have to subtract out Bill because Bill would not fulfill that criteria of being part of only group A by being in group A as part of the overlap. So let's take a look at an example here. We'll keep the Venn diagram for reference, but ultimately we're going to rely more on the formula we just saw. So you can see that We've got this example, if 90% of the 400 students at Beavis High take either biology or physics, and the number of students taking only physics is 25% greater than the number taking biology, how many students take biology? So we're ultimately trying to solve for B, but one of the things that we could do to expedite this is ignore our neithers by taking 90% of 400 to start so that we're focusing only on the pieces in the circle. So we know that 0.9 times 400 is going to be equal to 360. Again, that would be 90 times 40 if you just shift the decimal over on one side and shift it to the left on the right-hand side with the integer. And we know that 360 is our total without the neithers. So now we know that those taking only physics can be articulated as the group of physics minus the overlap. So our physics minus the overlap is going to be equal to 1.25b with b representing those taking biology. So we've got a clear algebraic expression here, and we know that our total without neither is going to be equal to 360, which is going to be equal to now the biology students plus physics minus overlap of 1.25b, and we can solve directly for that uh, 2.25b when we add b to 1.25b, knowing that 360 is now equal to 2.25b. Depending on how you want to work through this, you could do a litany of different ways of working through the problem. You could divide by 2.25 directly into 36, uh, 360, or you can manipulate it as a fraction. You could have that as 9 fourths b, multiply both sides by 4, divide by 9. However, you want to do the manual calculation is at your discretion, but ultimately, however you choose to divide by 2.25, you'll learn that B is going to be equal to exactly 160. So then we've got three groups. 
And that's where it starts to get even more complex. And remember that the way that the GMAT focus is going to increase its difficulty is by giving you more steps, giving you more things to track, not necessarily introducing differential calculus. So you can go from two to three sets realistically on an individual problem solving overlapping sets scenario. So let's just define what we have here with our total is equal to G1 plus G2 plus G3 minus exactly two groups minus two times the quantity all three plus none. So group with a little subscript is just that indica independent categorization. So it'd be like if we had three science classes instead of the two of biology and physics, if we had biology, physics, and oh, uh, what's the other science? Uh, uh, life sciences, although I think that's kind of biology. It's been a long time since I've done science. So life sciences, biology, and physics, that would be just life sciences, biology, and physics as one, two, and three. And that could also have somebody in both group, in two groups, or in all three groups. When we're talking about exactly two groups, that means an individual is included in two of the independent categories. And you can see a relatively complex little Venn diagram set up on the right hand side of the screen. That would be like if you were in two of the circles, but not all three of the circles. And it could be a combination of group one and group three, group one and group two, or group two and group three, and you would be categorized as exactly two groups. But if you're in all three, that means you're included in all three independent categories. So you'd be the exact center of that Venn diagram on the slide. And the key here is to recognize that the same logic as to why we had to subtract out the in the overlap for the two group equation is at play here. If somebody is counted in two groups, they've been counted twice. We only want to count them once. That's why we subtract those that are in exactly two groups that one time. However, if Bill were in all three categories here, Bill has been counted three times, and we don't want to count Bill more than once. So we have to subtract Bill out twice, or anyone who's in all three categories must be subtracted out twice to ensure they are not triple counted, nor double counted, and are only single counted. So let's take a look at one more example. We have Barrel's Garden, and we're going to use the formula above. We know in Barrel's Garden of 30 plants, 20 are flowering, 17 are perennials, and 8 are succulents. If eight of Beryl's plants are flowering succulent perennials and five have exactly two of these listed qualities, how many of her plants are neither flowering perennial nor succulent? So we're ultimately being asked to solve for those that are none. So we start to just fill in the pieces of the equation. We know 30 is the number of plants. That's our total on the left-hand side of the equal sign. Then we know 20 is group one, 17 is group two, eight is group three. We then know that exactly five have exactly two of these qualities. So we subtract out that five. And then we have eight of the plants that are flowering succulent perennials that categorize themselves in all three of the groups. So we have to multiply that eight by two when we subtract it to make sure we don't triple nor double count this group. Plus those that are none. And of course, we're trying to solve for the none. So we'd have 30 and then we just process the math. 30 plus 17, or sorry, 20 plus 17 is 37. 37 plus 8 is 45. 45 minus 5 is going to be our uh, 40. And 40 minus 16, and that's how you get your minus 21, is going to be down to 24. And 24 plus none is going to equal that 30. And none is going to be 6. There's a lot of moving pieces, and obviously, if we're not working scratch paper at the same time, it's a little bit tricky to track all of it. But if you're writing out all of the steps, you can see how everything aligns. And this is way more efficient if you're working through overlapping sets using the equation or equations, depending on how it's structured, rather than trying to fill in a bunch of Venn diagram circles, because that's just going to be uh, onerous from a time management perspective. So we do have one more overlapping set equation that the mutually exclusive group equation for three groups. This can be extrapolated to any number of characteristics. So it could be to four or five or six or seven or eight because you can't have something be both in exactly one category and exactly two categories. So you can see the equation above. To the total is going to be equal to those that are in none of the categories plus those that are in exactly one category plus those that are exactly two categories, plus those that are in all three categories, because you can only do one of these categorizations at a time. You can't have Bill be in two categories and three categories exactly at the same time. 
And this is a really savvy shortcut for some of the more complex group word problems because you'll see all of the different iterations and you'll be like, how do I get there? And this seems like it's gonna take forever. So with that, let's move on over to the whiteboard and actually see this mutually exclusive group equation in action so you can use it with your practice of overlapping sets on the quantitative reasoning section. So we've got a little table here and we can see how complex this might get pretty quickly just at a first glance. But as always, we'll skip to the end of the problem, figure out what we're being asked to solve for. And we can see we're being asked for how many of the coworkers replied that they like none or one of the three toppings on their hot dog. So we've got our none plus exactly one. And we've got real numbers in the answer choices, 6, 16, 18, 22, and 197. So everyone in a group of 100 coworkers, so our total is equal to 100. And remember, always be looking up and making sure that you're eliminating impossible answer choices. It can't be 197 at this point. It has to be fewer than 100. So goodbye to choice E. Then... Each of these co-workers was asked which of three toppings they like on their hot dogs, and we've got the results summarized in the table. So we've got the topping, we've got the number. And it's at your discretion to a degree whether you want to write out these table pieces. I'm inclined to do so because it might help me see what's happening. So we know that mustard is equal to 70. We know that CS for celery salt is equal to 65, and R for relish is equal to 62. And then we've got our combinations. We've got M and R, which is going to be equal to 43. We've got M and CS as an overlap, which is equal to 45. And our R and CS, which is going to be equal to 40. And then we've got our all three which are gonna be equal to 25. And you're probably thinking to yourself at this point, well, whew, there's a lot going on here. And I probably don't want to try to figure out exactly how all of this works with a Venn diagram or going into all of the details about all of the different iterations that are possible. But we do know that because all three is 25, we could start to set up our mutually exclusive group equation. So we know that the total is gonna to be equal to 100. And that's going to be equal to those that are in none plus those that are in exactly one plus those that are in exactly two plus those that are in all three. And we already know that the all three is going to be 25. Now, what we have to figure out is savvily how to determine what exactly two is. Because you can see, and we remember that we always want to solve for the exactly sought value even if it's a combination, I don't want to go and solve for everything in the group equation at this point. I don't need to build a table or a Venn diagram to do that. I need to get to exactly none plus one. So what I really need to know is how many are in exactly two. And we can determine that if we take any two group designation minus the all, because if you're in two groups, you're also going to be in all three, is going to be that exact combination. So that means when we're looking at M and R, we could do M and R only as being equal to 43 minus 25, which is going to be equal to 18. Because we know that if you like M and R, you're, you could have some that like all three, and so that's going to be our M and R only. Then we've got our M and celery salt only, that exact combination, and that's going to be equal to 45 minus 25. And that's going to be 20, not 25, 20. And then we've got our R and CS only. And that's going to be equal to our 40 minus that same 25 that were all three for a total of 15. So now we know that the exactly two is going to be 18 plus 20, which is going to be 38. 38 plus 10 is going to give me 48. 48 plus 5 will give me 53 for exactly 2. So that means that if we just subtract out, well, that's going to be uh, 
53 plus 20 is going to be 73. 73 plus 5 is going to be 78. I can subtract out 78 from our 100. And we discover that 22 is equal to our none plus 1 as a direct solution without having to build all of the different pieces. And we can pick D confidently and relatively efficiently, even though that table looks probably a bit intimidating to start with. So those are the general ways in which you're going to engage with overlapping sets, whether there are two categories or three categories, as you engage with this, what is believed to be one of the higher end difficulty question types that you can encounter in the quantitative reasoning section. So good luck practicing these questions on your own to improve at this high difficult style problem.